Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown and this is LA Currents. Well, he's been LA's chief lawyer and prosecutor since July of 2013. I am delighted to be joined today by LA City Attorney Mike Fuhr. You've been extremely vocal recently about vaccine right. mandates. And there are a lot of things in the air when it comes to vaccine mandates. So how would that work? So let's identify a couple different categories of mandate. First, the city council just approved a vaccine mandate for city employees. And I think that's really important, especially employees are coming in contact with the public all the time. And if in fact, a person who is capable, able, and physically um, unwilling to get a vaccine, do they lose employment when it comes to these? That remains to be seen in the city. I think there are options that the city can take. The city could say that, the city could provide some suspension without pay, the city could do any of a number of things that has yet to be determined. Um, when it comes to the mandate that I've called for in those public spaces, restaurants, bars, gyms, those kinds of locations, uh, the consequence is you don't get in. Is there a precedent for this kind of action? Not that I can recall. Okay. I mean, this is, but we live in a time that is utterly unprecedented. Got it. You know, the Spanish flu in 1918 provided us with some template for how this kind of a pandemic can spread. But by and large, everything that's happening now with regard to the pandemic is something we are learning as we go through it. And we're learning lessons from this. And one of those lessons is, at this point, getting the vaccine is imperative and it's safe. And for anybody who is watching who is skeptical of that, I will just say, FDA just gave approval formally in the same way it's approved all the other vaccines that you and your family take in order for your kids to go to school, for example. This is now in that very same category, get it done. The pandemic created a lot of opportunities for scam artists, and you've right. been fighting very diligently right. about that as well. So what are some of the things that people should be cognizant of, aware of, and protect themselves from? when there were those who attempted to price gouge, to charge excessive amounts for necessities. We worked closely with Amazon, for example, to help us identify who online was involved in trying to charge excessive amounts to the public. We went after them. The public should know that we are investigating other facets of how the pandemic touches their lives, that intersection of consumer protection and public health. And it may be that in the next couple of weeks, we emerge with some new information and perhaps a new case or two that will matter a lot. This is probably the time in the life of the city that's been the most challenging since I can remember. Really? Because there are so many crises that are converging at this and that the convergence of those issues makes it all the more important that each of us steps way beyond what we're used to doing to try to solve these things. We have everything from the pandemic to uh, homelessness to urgent calls for racial justice and police reform, crime is it. However, especially gun violence is escalating in South Los Angeles. We get all these issues at once and uh, that calls on us to lead. You've been very also vocal about um, the eviction moratorium. It's not the fault of the tenant or the landlord that the pandemic has so devastated the economy that the tenant has lost her job and she can't afford to pay the landlord. And at the inception of this, I reached out, including to a member of Congress, to say it's essential that there be some federal aid here because unlike the city government, which must balance its budget, and the state government, which must do the same, the federal government can borrow money in a crisis. And this is a real crisis. Right. And in the middle of the pandemic, when that dynamic's in play, we also had the potential for many of these tenants to lose their apartments. In Los Angeles, we have 41,000 people who are homeless on the streets of our city, 30,000 of whom have no place to live on a given night. So to face the possibility of those numbers escalating dramatically in combination with all the other emergencies we're facing right now was, was a bridge too far. At this moment, providing some stability to that tenant who otherwise is on the precipice of losing their place to live is vital. Your Our Neighborhood Justice Plan, it's working. Oh, it's been fabulous. So, and I wanna encourage our viewers to participate with us in this. They can volunteer to join us in this. There's been a lot of discussion about criminal justice reform. Here's what that means to me in this program. It means we're trying to inter interrupt the trajectory of the life of someone who is starting to commit crime and turn their life around. 
I want to reduce recidivism, which means reducing the likelihood of a repeat offense. So neighborhood justice does a lot of great things at once. We say to someone who's committed a nonviolent offense, um, if you go through neighborhood justice, we won't prosecute you. You won't have a record. Neighborhood justice involves the recruitment of hundreds of volunteers throughout our city. We recruit them and we train them in principles of restorative justice. The person who committed the offense comes into a nonprofit center where we have the sessions occur. Three of those trained volunteers sits with the um, person who committed the offense. It's also a supervisor who oversees the process. And their job is to say, look, we live in the neighborhood where the crime was committed. We're here because we want to improve our neighborhood and we want to help you too and hold you accountable all at once. So the person comes in, they have to take responsibility for what they did. They come in and they explain what happened, why they did what they did, what their life is like. Those panelists prescribe an obligation in the community that that person must perform because the community has been diminished by that crime, not just a single victim. So it might be tutoring kids or painting out graffiti or lecturing on the dangers of alcohol sales to, to high school students or fixing vandalized property, whatever. So in addition, we try to offer intervention when we can, like job training, for instance. And we know the program works. We've had thousands of people go through it. And the recidivism rate for misdemeanors generally is 30, 40, 50 percent. For our neighbor justice program, 5 percent. Almost no one is recommitting an offense. So we know this is working. And I know from the volunteer standpoint, it's very rewarding. We've had two of our volunteers submit to the LA Times opinion pieces that have run in the paper. And the essence of both pieces is this. In this tumultuous world, volunteers have written, I've been struggling with how I can add value in my community, how I can actually make life better. It's such, those problems are so huge. In neighborhood justice, I found my place. I have found a way to help turn around someone's life and make my neighborhood safer at the same time. So it's a win for everybody. And so these volunteers are in a position of uh, passing their wisdom on, um, talking to this person who's committed this misdemeanor, coming up with creative ideas. I mean, what is the parameter of this volunteer person? So the volunteers sit in panels of three mm -hmm. and they inquire of the person who committed the offense, you know, so much your life, why'd you do what you do? They ask very pointed questions sometimes. One, I, I watched one session where a theft was involved and one of the volunteers said, you know, I understand your circumstances are very tough, but I don't have much money and I live here and I shop in that store too and I spend more than I should for the items I buy because they have to have a line in their budget for loss because people like you oh. steal from them. I mean, so there's a lesson in that exchange when that very authentic volunteer is describing very sincerely why this matters and the person who committed the offense is taking responsibility for what she did at the same time learning about the impact on others. Um, and I just think that this is the f future direction for a lot of criminal justice. We prosecute some, a lot of cases where there is a serious punitive component, a, a domestic violence assault, for example, or the sex abuse of kids. We have cases like that that we handle. Sure. But there are other cases involving the theft of a nominal amount of, of, my, of money or goods or other kinds of crimes for which accountability is really important, but where we have a chance to say, let's change your life a little bit so you don't do it again. And, and that's the beauty of this program. And I, again, for misdemeanor offenses, we've had others around the country seek us out to learn how they can replicate their pro our program in other parts of America. And I think that that's a sign that we're onto something. If people want to get more information? So they can go to our website, lacityattorney.org. They can, on the website, they can find our phone number as well. I'm sure you'll post uh, that phone you number on this. And um, I just want to say, I know that this is a tough time for everybody, but things will get better if we come together as a team. And much of what we're trying to do in the city attorney's office is to set a standard and recognize that our community, and there are people who do things wrong for which they need to be accountable, but we can also work together to make LA better. Good. And that's a wrap on this LA Currents.